but exactly. a common misconception is that it's the game that's making it fun when in fact the learning that happens in games is what makes games fun this week on backward compatible jim doc and chris discuss gamification and game-based learning as it applies in the classroom and in professional talent development plus res infinite mystic veil mario maker and more BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 108 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hello, hello. And our meeting topic of discussion today is one that we've been wanting to come back to for a while. Uh, if you've been following us for a long time, you might remember a couple years ago, we had a guest on Andy Howell, and he talked a lot about how he applies uh, games to learning. As a learning therapist, he would uh, you know, use games to help teach history, for example, or something like that. But one of the things that we want to talk a little bit more about is, uh, you know, Jim and I both have some experience in uh, applied game design or rather game design as applied to learning. Uh, so back when I was in grad school, um, I worked in the uh, games and learning lab at UT Dallas, um, doing a lot of research about games and pedagogy and that sort of thing. Uh, Jim works at iStation, which uh, mm-hmm. is very heavily involved with making games for the classroom. Mm-hmm. And I also um, was part of the development team. Doc and I both were. Um, for a learning game specifically aimed at teachers, actually, mm-hmm. Very true. Um, while at UTD. Yep. And uh, now I'm actually working at a company where part of my job is doing uh, gamification and game-based learning yes. for uh, professional development. Um, so we all have a lot of things, I think, that we can contribute to this area of discussion. And I've heard some rumors that, that um, Doc, you may have had some background in teaching related to gaming at some point i i don't know, I don't know. i'm I, not sure i owned a school or something oh yeah. right yeah something I don't know. <laughs> it's a little a little something have a master's in education or whatever mm-hmm. right uh but this, this is a big topic we've been looking forward to for a long time and we think uh there should be a lot of good stuff to come out of it uh but first we have some opening segments for you including the button mosh get ready for the button mosh where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately so um earlier um actually yesterday i downloaded um, a game I've been planning to play for some time and just never really got around to it. And sort of other things came up and I forgot. Um, it's actually a game that originally released on the Dreamcast, uh, which I owned. I never played it on that system either. Um, and I'm actually talking about Res, um, or actually its name, the, uh, the re-release version, the remake, not really a remake, kind of a re-release with updated graphics, Res Infinite um, for the PS4. And uh, this is, if, if you're unfamiliar with this game, it's essentially a um, rail shooter, which which means that you don't actually control your character's movement at all. Uh, you're actually just controlling your aim. So the game is always moving you forward, and you just control where you're aiming and shooting. I think um, I played the uh, VR demo of that, actually. It was pretty, yes, it was pretty interesting. It is on VR as well, and I, I do not have PlayStation VR. It seems like a really fun, it would be a really fun game to play in VR, um, because the graphics and the because of the graphics and the music essentially and the way the game is set up is um it feels like you're in a um the 1980s uh version of what cyberspace would be <laughs> is, is what the game, whole game feels like where you're in this uh seemingly uh, you're in a digital environment and everything is um vector graphics very um, um uh lots of polygons and, and geometric shapes and you are essentially just little like floating creature that kind of resembles a um, humanoid form, but that can upgrade and and level up sort of kind of, which is really just being able to take an extra hit um, into looking more and more humanoid by progressing through the game and killing things within the game. And of course, when you take damage, the reverse happens. You become less humanoid. You start to be less solid and to eventually you no longer have um, skin quote, whatever it might be around your um, cybernetic body or like little geometric shaped body. Mm -hmm. Um, And then eventually at when you're about to die, as I found out earlier today, um, you become essentially just a little orb of some sort, like Mm -hmm. a geometric orb. Um, And I, that I, 
That was not a very good description. <laughs> um, you're not really a sphere. Essentially, you are a bunch of flat um, rectangles that are constructed so that they resemble a sphere mm. is my, the best way to describe it. But you're clearly not a sphere. Um, and it has a very interesting system because the music is so integral to this experience. Um, each level has its own um, composer, which they actually they say, okay, here's the name of the song. Here's the composer for this song. And as you play through the level, um, it kind of reminded me of those old systems. And I, I, the name escapes me. Chris might know um, maybe about five, 10 years ago, maybe probably more like 10. They were all the rage on uh, computers where you would play your music through, through these systems, like a win app or something. And it would show like a visualization that would feel like you're traveling through um, a 3d environment that would react based on the music mm -hmm. I kind of remember those, those sort of yeah. things they were pretty cool and honestly res feels like that when you play through it i'm gonna doc watched it some yeah it feels like the music is the the space that you're in is interacting with the music and the beats and the music and your your the way that your your um your bullets work and the way that they're firing and the the sounds that they make um also feel like it's part of the music so you're you're playing a game yes but you're playing a game in which your experience and your, your your auditory experience, your oral experience is very much influenced by how you play. And so is the environment. And so everything, the visuals and the music and everything, it kind of gives you um, almost a sense of uh, synesthesia. Yeah, I was about to say that. It, yeah. it, it, it kind of does. And it's um, um, obviously not quite, but it's definitely that's the experience that they're going for. Mm -hmm. I think um, Nick also, I think, would, would be very interested in trying this game out and kind of seeing how they do the um, sound design for it because it's, it's pretty unique and I'm a little surprised that it came out so long ago. Um, over 10 geez, it was probably, oh, yeah, probably about 10 years ago at this point, actually probably not quite that. Long. Um, but close, no, no, I take that back. Um, almost 20 years now, it'd be 15 to 20 years, right? Cause the dreamcast came out in 1999. Mm. This was one of the games didn't live, didn't last for the system didn't last very long. So it must've been almost 20 yeah, years ago. I was going to say you're a lot older than you think you're right. <laughs> right. So it's pretty surprising and it really hasn't been something that I, other games have sort of done a little bit of it, but um, really is not a concept that really caught on much, but I feel it's um, definitely an interesting game that I'd recommend you try out. Actually it's on sale, which it will not be when this episode releases, but it's still worth buying um, for, I, I think it's 25 or 29 99 when it's not on sale hmm. um so definitely definitely check it out because it is very very fun and different is is the key thing if you're just tired of constantly playing a game that feels like you're playing the same game but now you look a little different <laughs> um this is not that it's different and it is a short game somewhat challenging game but surprisingly simple to learn difficult to master but very simple to learn very few controls you have to worry about it's just you use an analog stick to aim you have a fire button that you can hold down to lock onto enemies and like swipe the aim stick around it and then let go and it kind of shoots everything out of what you've locked onto. Or you can just move the mouse over it and shoot. I mean, the analog stick mm -hmm. over it and shoot. Then you have one extra button and that is kind of a kill everything on screen mode that you can only activate if you um, earn that power up throughout play. And that's it. I mean, it's that simple. There's not complicated controls um but it can get pretty challenging mm -hmm. so um it's it's one of those easy 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 to learn how to play the game mm -hmm. difficult to master kind of arcade like it sounds like arcade like yeah. yes and um different i mean i different and i think that's good now is the time for reading list in which our impeccable curators recommend the finest materials for your reading listening and viewing pleasure This book is called uh, Story by Robert McKee. The subtitle here is uh, Substance, Structure, Style, and the Principles of Screenwriting. So they focus on screenwriting, writing for movies primarily, but also they'll talk a little bit about you know, TV and that sort of thing. But the focus really is on movies. And yet the principles that they're hitting on, I think, can apply to writers of any sort. I think it can apply to people who write books, people who write games. Um, I've been finding it especially interesting because one of Doc and my projects um, is a game that's about basically telling stories through role playing. Um, we look very specifically at structure and scenes and that sort of deal. And so um, I've been finding it extremely useful for that. Um, what I really like about it is that 
you know, he has a very particular approach that maybe not everyone will use. And he also says like, this isn't a prescription, you know, this is just the, what I do, my guidelines. And he has a lot of really good principles that you can apply in a bunch of different ways. Um, but he, you know, makes a point of saying like, you know, this isn't necessarily the, there's never a checklist approach to writing. And what I'm really enjoying about it is that it's very practical in its advice. It talks about specific things you need to be looking for uh, when writing a scene, when writing a story arc and writing the entire film that you need to be make sure you need to be making sure that you're hitting on as you go through um, and kind of, again, a very practical sense. You know, a lot of times when we're talking about writing or hearing advice from writers, they sort of say good things about the process or they'll say good things about like very sort of high level generalities about story. And we've even done the same thing. But he starts breaking down um, like, you know, every scene needs to have a turning point. And, you know, you need to have what he calls like a, uh, a charge for the scene. So you're going from a positive charge to a negative charge, as he calls it. So, for example, you've got a value, um, say it is, uh, you know, safety or danger. Um, and so you start off in a dangerous situation and you want the scene to shift from negative to positive, probably, or the other way around where you go from safety to danger, or danger to safety based on what it is the character's doing. Um, he talks a lot about, um, I mentioned the turning points being, Things that uh, I think break the audience's expectation. I might be getting those that, those words wrong, but it's about kind of giving the audience enough hints as to what's coming so they stay engaged, but then also subverting their expectations to keep them surprised and keep them interested rather than just sort of being super predictable and them getting bored of it really quickly. Um, really great stuff. I highly recommend the book. Um, they have a lot of cool diagrams in there that you can check out. Um, they sort of break down uh, different things about plot structure, about story structure. Um, That's what sold it for me. Scene actually, structure. The, yeah. The diagrams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of visualizations. I love and actually collect story mm -hmm. visualizations. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was, it's huge on that. Mm -hmm. I believe there is an audio book for this, but it's abridged and it's only like six hours when it's abridged. So I'm not sure what it is they're leaving out, but the book's not that short. Well, <laughs> um, the visualizations for one. Well, yeah, for <laughs> one. Um, but they, they don't take up that much space of the book. So, um, I definitely recommend either getting it in print or as an ebook. Do, do they describe the visualizations in the audio book that I don't know? No clue. <laughs> haven't, uh, haven't listened to it, but yeah. Uh, impulse by it right now it sounds interesting though who did you say it was by uh robert mckee robert mckee yeah m-c-k-e-e -E. okay yeah, i'm gonna check that out uh and i think that really does apply to a lot of what we talk about here with story um just very briefly one of the things that i highlighted for uh uh doc and showed him the other day you know we've talked before about branching dialogue systems and player choice and that sort of deal many times um and about like kind of what choices are good which ones are bad and you know here's here's just a thing i really like this is him talking about the nature of choice um and this is just what i've highlighted a turning point is centered in the choice a character makes under pressure to take one action or another in the pursuit of desire human nature dictates that each of us will always choose the good or the right as we perceive the good or the right and then i skipped a little bit and the other thing i highlighted after that is the choice between good and evil or between right and wrong is no choice at all. So a lot of times when we talk about binary choices feeling kind of shallow, it's because they're presenting us with something that's very clearly the good choice and the evil choice. That's not really a choice. The choice comes down to doing something that other people might see as evil because it is clearly the right choice in that circumstance. Right. To you. It's, it's like when you're presented with, do you want to kick the puppy or kick the kitten? <laughs> you got two legs. Come on, people. <laughs> Uh, but the point being there that you have to like, it, and it's something that we've discussed before in one way or the other, but I just think the, the way that he phrases some things kind of taking it from a different perspective, a different angle, just a different way of saying it, a different way of thinking about it. Mm. It's really flipped a lot of switches for me. That's I, I, again, I highly, highly recommend it. Now it's time for table talk discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So I had a chance to play one of the most interesting games, board games, that I have played in a very long time. Technically, it's a card game. I lump it into the big category there. Uh, the game is called Mystic Veil. Mm. Okay. Now, the game itself is a card creation uh, mechanic. And, and I mean it when I say that. Doc, do you mean like deck building? No. And I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> it wasn't a setup at all. Uh, <laughs> Well, basically, we do have uh, certain games that would be uh, a deck building system, and, and, and we have uh, certain systems that would be like even a hand building system, right? But this is a card building system. And what that means is you've got these clear, um, think, uh, think Gloom, if you're familiar with that game, uh, but clear cards and sleeves, 
And what you do is you take the, sl- the card and you buy it with your little mana points or your crystal points or whatever it is, and you slip them into the sleeve. There's a top, there's a middle, there's a bottom to each card. So the, the meta behind it is that there's a, uh, a magical glade right? A veil, which is uh, corrupted. Oh no. And so what you need to do is you need to go in with your, uh, I don't know, some kind of cabal or something and go clean, magically clean up the the glade. And so, mm. you, you know, you're different sets of druids and you're going and you're doing this. Who cares? Uh, you're going into Mordor and, and you're fixing it, right? <laughs> and whatever. Um, but that that is just a... That's a loose construct to do this really amazing mechanic, unlike anything I've ever played before. The idea of um, putting more cards into your hand in the deck building system has always kind of bugged me. Because the, the further you go, the less chance you have of getting that card again, right? Well, the brilliance of this is you start with 20 cards. Most of them are blank. You're talking about blank sleeves that are in your deck. And you put a power onto that and actually change the card, slip it into, into your sleeve then you've still got that one in 20 chance of drawing it always. So you can strategize. Do I want this card to be mostly bad, mostly good? Do I want to put powers in here that let me burn cards out that let me draw more cards? Uh, There's a push mechanic that lets you, uh, it's a little bit like a blackjack or 21 (laughs) in in the sense of, do I want to, um, you know, how much corruption am I willing to risk? Because once you get that fourth corruption out there, boom, you've got, you've skipped your turn. You've, you've lost your turn. Uh, but there's some things that balance it out and let you, uh, you know, get some gems if you fail and things like that. But ultimately what it comes down to is a uh, two to four player game where you are competing against largely yourself, um, but also the others too, for what's out there. And, and you pay points to bring the cards into your hand and then adjust the cards, the 20 cards that you have by putting them into the sleeves. Hmm. Um, There's all kinds of expansions to it. There's like four or five. And what's amazing to me is uh, even though it's a relatively new game, it has already won some awards. It's the uh, 2017 origins award for best traditional card game, which I find highly ironic (laughs) Uh, and the fan favorite, which doesn't surprise me a bit. So um, check it out. It's called Mystic Veil. And then there are expansions. There's the Veil of Magic expansion. There's the Veil of the Wild expansion. And there's even something called the uh, Mystic Veil Event Kit. I have no idea what this is, hmm. but it's Spirits of the Veil is the name of that expansion. When, when you played it, did you play just the vanilla set? No, I played with two expansions okay. uh, mixed in. And uh, there's one that has heroes and kind of changes that a little bit. That's a card that stays out all the time, gives you a special power if you're into that kind of a thing, if it sounds a little too generic for you. Um, basically, the, the great thing about it is you can play the way that you want to play it. And, and by bringing in the expansions, if you think of it in terms of um, deck building, <laughs> right? right. Um, you're deciding in the advance what, how, what form you want the whole game to take for everyone. Mm, and so how, about how long does each game take? Well, I played a two-player game and it took about half an hour. And that was including teaching me how to play super simple mechanics mm. adjusted by the cards themselves. Mm. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by this because for the longest time, I've always thought it'd be really cool to have a game where you're using, you know, partially clear cards to build uh, new cards out of. Yeah. Um, you know, my idea of my idea has always been to like, you know, have a character almost MMO style where you start off with the base character and then you keep add, adding things that change your stats, but yeah. also change your appearance, like adding armor on top, for example, uh-huh. or adding a weapon. Um, so it sounds like that's not necessarily what's happening in this one, but I'm still super intrigued by the idea of having, you know, cards that you're constructing out of, you know, different yeah. parts. And I would love to see that be carried on into other, <laughs> other and more um, varied games. Actually, what you just described is bears versus babies Mm. uh, which is also brand new (laughs) and i had a chance to play um a terrible game Uh, i loved the mechanic and and in so many ways it's awful uh (laughs) especially the not safe for work just no no do not give them your money no um but you're going to and i know you're going to so have fun when you play it but um (laughs) No, it, that honestly is the best analog I can come up with because this is so revolutionary. It's so um, just innovative mm. that I think it opens up the door of potential of, look, we have this new mechanic. Let's make games. You could make a sci-fi game. You could make anything you wanted in this really uh, totally new way of playing a card game. And that's what excites me more than anything. The meta, eh, sure, it's a mystic failure, a druid, whatever. Don't care. I get to actually slip stuff into a card cover and make 
my deck as I go. Cool. That is really cool. Yeah, yeah that, that actually does sound very cool. So, uh, yeah, Mystic Veil, uh, give it a try. It's time for War Stories. Tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. So uh, um, I had some family come visit, and uh, including my my five year old nephew, and um, he played some Mario Maker. Uh, it was a game that he had seen on the um, on YouTube on the YouTube <laughs> on uh, YouTube or actually YouTube the kids YouTube. There's like a kids version that helps them search for things with their voice, which I never even knew this existed, and it seems incredible. Lots of Barney and uh, Daniel Tiger. Apparently, it just it just uh, navigates them more to video over text, and also lets them search via their voice. Uh, it was kind of cool. Oh, good. We don't want to teach them to read or anything. That would be well. True, we don't. Yeah, no. um, I imagine it also filters out things that might not be uh, topically appropriate for kids. Yes. One would hope. <laughs> yes. Um, my sister, um, his mother, says that it's not actually the best at that, but uh, um, it, it is supposed to. It's, it's, it's a start, at least. It's a start. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so he had been watching Mario Maker because he was watching people on that game, um, actually watching them and hoping that they would lose um, on that game, as he told me. Oh, oh, kids. Or actually, he said hoping they would be killed. Uh, specifically um so dark yes um so he was excited to play it because i i have the game and they do not have a wii u um so um and mario maker is actually a a very fun game i've been playing it it's uh, what i like about it is that it um makes level design fun the actual just and i don't just mean um you might have fun in terms of figuring out how to design a level. I mean, literally the part, the aspect of building that level is fun. Mm. It makes that fun. The, the sound experience, the musical experience, yes. um, the way the UI works. It's like, it, it's the way the, the UI works. It's yes, the way you part. wish like actual game design tools work because yes. it's just so much more enjoyable. It's <laughs> very enjoyable and it's very intuitive. And I just, I, I just handed him the tablet and let him play. And I didn't really give him any um, sort of information aside from, you know, I told him, hey, if you click this button in the corner, you can play through what you've done so far and you click it again and you can go back to edit mode. And I showed him the area at the top. Um, he just called it the top stuff. And if he uses his, I, I handed him a little pen and I said, hey, you can just click and drag. And he started learning. Oh, I can open it up and there's more stuff in there that I can play around with. I can drag in these elements. And at one point he actually learned completely by accident that if you shake a lot of the um, items, they become something different. It's part of it's part mm. of the game. Huh. So, like, if you shake, say, Bowser, um, when you drag a Bowser into the game and you shake him a lot, like just you know, real quickly, he will transform into Bowser Junior. And it has different properties and different AI. Mm-hmm. Um, and I showed him how you can switch between um, different backgrounds for the level, different like you know elements for that level. So, for example, if you're doing a ground level. It's like the outside areas of Mario, but there's also the underwater Mario levels of Mario. Those have different properties. The way that you interact with the levels is a little bit different. Um, there's the dungeon areas, which are a little bit different because there's lava pits on areas that are considered, you know, open. Um, and then there's also the, and also different music too, it changes each time. Um, there's the airship levels, which are not available in certain uh, types of Mario. I'll get to that in a second. Um, which are also pretty neat. And I, I think there's, there's like, I think there's a night, is there a nighttime one? I forget. Is there it, about the other ones in there? I think I named all of them. The dungeon. Uh, oh, there's like a haunted house. I mm-hmm. forget the haunted house for like Mario world and the new one. Um, and then the other part that they have um, in this game is that they have the different um, Mario types in the game. So like our, our style wise and your options in terms of power ups. So there's the original super Mario brothers, which is the NES style graphics. Mm-hmm. Um, with the NES power-ups, and there's the Super Mario Brothers 3, which means you can have the raccoon suit, little leaf, and all that, Mm -hmm. and those style graphics. Um, And, of course, all the enemies are also tied to each of those styles. Mm -hmm. And there's also the um, Super Mario World style graphics and power-ups. And they also get the ability, for example, to do the spin jump, which unlocks a whole whole new mechanic. Which you can't do in the earlier games because you couldn't do that in the actual game before, in those earlier games. And then there's the final one, which is the new Super Mario Bros. style, which is like the... um, they call it like 2.5d basically your it's 3d graphics but 2d gameplay and that's kind of like the su- the new super mario bros um games that have come out you know re- somewhat recently and that adds i believe a uh, wall jumping among other it things. adds wall jumping and some other stuff too so a few different mechanics but the but the key is that all the other mechanics in the game and the way the enemies work um are translatable between each style so you can on the fly as you're building a level these are not choices you make at the beginning everything is on the fly changed 
you can on the fly decide, I don't want this to be a Mario 3 level. I want it to be a New Super Mario World level. Or I want it to be a New Super Mario Brothers level. Or, um, oh, I made this entire level as a dungeon. No thanks. I'm going to make it underwater level. Just out of the blue, you can just change it. Um, and of course, sometimes that means that an enemy that you made might no longer, ex- like, might not exist in the sense that he'll change to a different enemy type. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he won't. Sometimes he'll be a reinterpreted version of that in the new graphics. It happens a lot with the 8 bit version, the NES version, um, that you normally can't even use you can't even drag them in unless you drag them in from an other mario game and then translate it back to the nest version it's oh, really clever interesting. Huh. how they do that it's very very clever um and he was just figuring this stuff out as he was playing through it um his this kind of led me to a couple of you know realizations of what i kind of expected from this game but i hadn't actually experienced it myself firsthand watching someone play it or some i should say watching a young child play it who cannot read um or he's, he's just learning i guess you can say but one is the intuitiveness of the interface is, is a big part of it, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that even, you know, a young child can learn and, and, and figure out. But the other part of it is the fun factor of building levels. I mean, this this game is, yes, it's about building levels and then playing through them. But he didn't really have as much fun playing through the levels, in part because he was making very difficult levels that he could not actually win. Because he liked dragging in lots of enemies and traps, um, of course. So he would die very quickly, but he did like um, he did like actually building the levels. That part was very fun, and I think they did a very good job of that. And when we talk a little bit later about games and learning, um, I think that's something to consider, too, is is not just um, games and learning, but learning through gaming Mm -hmm. and also this concept of, you know, as you're as you're learning how to build games and as you're building games. Um, finding a way to make that fun is part of it too. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that's easy, obviously. Um, otherwise, everybody would have done this, right? I mean, Nintendo would have done this years ago if it was so easy. It's not. Um, but this was a very successful example. Uh, Mario Maker. It requires certain things that a lot of systems don't have, like for example, um, the tablet controls and being able to drag things down instantly and seeing what happens. That wouldn't work very well. Maybe if you if you had like a mouse um, set up on on your PC, you could probably do it. It wouldn't be quite as intuitive as a tablet especially for the younger audience who is actually not used to PCs. We'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this game has been very successful. Um, the other thing that I learned is that um, sometimes you have to cheat because uh, what would he would want me to do is he would set up a pretty much impossible section. And he would actually get pretty good at it where if I jumped up, I would get hit by, by a thwomp. And if I fell down, there would be a bunch of spinies that would be between this small area. And if I, took the mushroom that was there it would make me big so therefore i was trapped there forever uh. <laughs> and i had to get hit and so he did all these little things and actually pretty clever particularly for a young kid mm-hmm. um so but he would want me to beat the level for him you know just beat it like thinking i couldn't do it um and i know in one level in particular i said all right and i start i started the level and i said just let me do one thing real quick and i went into edit mode mm-hmm. i changed it to a swimming level hmm. and then i just swam above all of his challenges and went straight to the flag <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes you got to cheat um but that's my war story for the week and now this week's meaty topic of discussion All right. So like we alluded to at the beginning of the episode, um, each of us kind of has our own background in education or in games as they relate to education or to learning in general. Um, Part of my master's program was working in the games and learning lab. Jim, you work at iStation. Um, I currently work at a place called Infinitude Creative Group where we do uh, game based learning gamification. And of course, Doc uh, taught games. Uh, He also uh, owned an academy where you uh, taught all sorts of subjects. You've got a degree in education. Um, so mm-hmm. we, we all have a pretty good background yeah. in this stuff. And, uh, for those that are not aware, um, iStation essentially um, makes educational software. Mm-hmm. So essentially um, games for kids, uh, not to learn how to make games, but uh, to learn things like how to like reading mm-hmm. concepts or 
math math concepts mm-hmm. things like that yeah um and so just real quick the, the little disclaimer we're mentioning the companies we work for but our uh, our views and opinions do not necessarily express the views or opinions of our parent companies no uh, they, do not. <laughs> they do not um, um except not at all I, unless it's really good and you really like it in which case you're free to associate us with them <laughs> <laughs> there's always that caveat but yeah i mean where do we want to start i mean i think that one thing i could talk about and something i've actually written about for um my company's blog is um um, the difference between gamification as it is typically known and what I call game based learning. Um, and so the way that a lot of people have described gamification, and I, I, I forget off the top of my head who I should credit with this, but someone came up with the term pointsification. And that's basically just taking the trappings of games, things like points and badges and all that different stuff, and just kind of slapping it on to something that's not really right. a game. And I, I was about to mention that because mm-hmm. I think I thought that one, I don't like the term gamification Mm -hmm. i'm a little like richard in that way Mm -hmm. um also i I feel like it is essentially a fancy way to say oh you're just giving achievements to things that you do yeah um it's basically just typically when someone talks about gamification of of any sort of activity Mm -hmm. what they really mean is um basically having achievements like xbox live yeah style achievements or ps4 trophies Mm -hmm. for things that you do in your everyday life that's usually what they mean when they say gamification which to me is not really motivating mm-hmm. and if they're gonna if they're gonna call it that like that's that's totally fine and sometimes it is like a nice little touch you can add to something that you already have but you know then at least just call it something like we're using a few game like elements you know for me gamification needs to go beyond just having the trappings of games and actually getting into what a lot of people have started calling games based learning because gamification got so abused yes. as a term and, and I, I i like that term much better mm-hmm. game based learning um or you, there's other term i mean you could say um, you know, I, I mean, a learning game, an educational mm-hmm. game. I think these are all fair terms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think they all are kind of different ways to say. It, obviously, you're you're trying to gear it towards you know, contra different imagery and gear it towards one particular style when you say game based learning. But mm-hmm. ultimately, it is a it is a, it is a learning game. It's a game in which you're you're going to learn something. Mm-hmm. And so, I imagine that on this episode, we might have a lot of people who don't have the gaming background that we all have. So. The definition of a game is something that's hotly contested in game studies, uh, so we're not going to get too deep into it's, it. It's really not. Mm-hmm. It's just people. Honest. It's it's real. And I say this a somewhat somewhat jokingly, mm-hmm. but to be quite honest, I think it's one of those things where um, oh, I forget which um, apparently not that famous senator, but there is a quote from a uh, um, senator that said about uh, pornography. Um, that said, you know, I can't necessarily define it, but I know it when I see it. And I think a lot of that can be said about games. I think we actually do have a pretty good definition here, to be honest with you, about mm-hmm. what, what is a game, what is not a game. But I think that we, we do have a very clear, oh, well, this is not a game, reaction to things that, quite frankly, are not games. And um, then there are people that will come back and go, wait, hold on a second, that mm-hmm. is a game. How dare you say that's not a game? As if being a game is a positive thing. <laughs> it's just not. It's just a statement of fact. You're either a game or you're not. Mm-hmm. You know? And we've had our own internal debates about this before. Sure, so. sure. Uh, but Doc, since you are the uh, the game design professor, do you want to give us your uh, definition or at least a definition of game? Well, sure. The one that I used to give in my class was a fourfold definition. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, basically, it was saying that a game was going to have a set of rules. Mm-hmm. It was going to have a victory condition of some kind mm-hmm. um, or at least a way to to fail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if there's a fail state, then there's that's the opposite. I think you changed that at one point to lose condition, basically, right, as opposed yeah. to win condition, and which I think is a good change. Honestly, honestly. It, was, it was Minecraft that did that because mm-hmm. there wasn't really a, a win state at that point. Uh, it got us to change the way we were thinking. But uh, then the third thing would be defined space in which the game can take place. And then the fourth is defined game elements. Uh, there has to be something you're playing the game with so just to use a popular example um if if we were talking about monopoly right you would have the little book that has the rules or in the case of monopoly the rules on the back of the box lid mm-hmm. right right uh, those are the rules right. everybody agrees we're going to play with those and then there's house rules too and we, we break some of those yeah, rules no one right. actually plays with the true rules of right monopoly. yeah free parking we got to take the money right um and then you've got okay how do i how do i win when do i know that i've won and that's usually in the rules and then you've got the defined space which is the board. We're not going to create our own board. We're not going to, you know, grab the magic markers and, and change the monopoly board. And then we've got the, all the other elements of the game, which are the money, the the shares, the little dog and the, the shoe, the shoe. the shoe. Yeah. You know, the thimble, I always liked the ah. thimble. Um, so <laughs> that that's 
that's unquestionably going to be considered a game. A good way to get around the whole argument of that's not a game is to say, we're not talking about the stuff that might or might not be a game. We're talking about the stuff that exactly. we can draw a circle around and say, it does fit those four mm-hmm. criteria or whatever criteria you want. Right. It's the things where we're, we're not, everyone looks at it and say, agrees this is a game. Not the things that some people will say, well, I think it's a game. And others people will say, well, maybe that's not a game for this reason. Yeah. The things that are clearly games. Yeah. So, um, and, and to differentiate from the other the, the things that I think are most often confused with games, which are any sort of interact, interactive experience mm-hmm. or an interactive environment are often mistaken for games. Right. And that's because games are interactive. Of course. But not all interactive activities are a game. Right. Or I, sh- I should specify digital interactive. Right. I mean, you, you interact with a book. Yes. I'm, I mean, digital interactive. Like, right. for example, you interact um, with an audio. Yes. Book. If you're ex- <laughs> if you if you are exploring a space and you can click on objects and things change within that space, that's not necessarily a game. Right. There has to be more elements to it. That doesn't mean that it's terrible. That doesn't mean that it's not fun. Yeah. You can have fun with these things. You can have an enjoyable experience. Possibly it could be art. There's there's actually um, a whole element of art that is literally just um, interact. It's called, it, I think it's interactive called interactive art, art or yeah. it's interactive, well, interactive. That's actually what my dissertation art. was about. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and so there's, of course, it's not that there's an, it's not a negative thing. It's not, you're not a game, therefore you're worthless. Of course not. No. Um, but it's important to identify what a game is because otherwise, how can we even talk about that? Right. And so when, Chris, whenever you say um, that there is a gamification process Mm -hmm. or that kind of a thing for other stuff, I completely agree with your assessment. That is different and not deep enough to say that it's a learning based game. Mm -hmm. So I guess my um, my question to you guys, then, Mm -hmm. since you actively work on these things, is what is the what is the goal? What is the outcome um, of uh, or, or at least the intended outcome of a learning based game see and i think i think we will probably have potentially different um mm-hmm. I, 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 would I would hope think, so i would think very different in some ways but in other ways very similar yeah right. um and I'll, I'll i'll just start and give you just briefly um so it's essentially our market is um geared towards the pre-k all the way through eighth grade Some of our content doesn't quite go to eighth grade um but that's essentially our, our area of expertise. Most of it is pre-K to fifth, and then we have some six to eight reading content, and we're developing. We're in the process of developing more. Um, our goal here is to essentially um, it, we're we're considered iStation is considered an intervention program, which means that we're actually geared more towards kids that are struggling to learn these concepts in school, mm-hmm. um, and so we give them these um, these in, these interactive activities, which are essentially games that we are going to um, determine like when we're going to teach them a concept and um, I'm, not, I'm not referring to the assessment, by the way, I'm talking about the actual program. We do have an assessment that kind of places them in different tiers, that kind of thing. So the actual activities themselves that they're going to be playing through essentially the games to use quotes, um, uh, but they are finger essentially quotes. games, finger quotes, games, <laughs> um, but they are games um, and uh, educational games. Um, and the goal in these games is to teach the kids a concept and then to test their mastery of those concepts. And if they are unable to um, successfully prove that they have mastered that concept, there is a lose condition. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they fail um, in whatever that activity is after they've learned, supposedly learned the concept, then they are sent to a different activity that is supposed to help them understand that concept better. And we call that a reteach. Mm -hmm. So they get a teach, then they get an activity that tests their teach. We call that the independent practice. And then they get the, uh, reteach, which is the, okay, you didn't get it. Slow down a bit. Let's go through it again. And then we're going to go back and then test your, either test your mastery one more time or send you to something else that might be say the building block for that concept. Let's go back a little bit. Maybe you didn't get this one piece about it. Let's look at that first. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back to this later. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's essentially well, yeah. what we're trying and to do. Our, our, te- these basic our teacher audience is going to recognize all the lingo that you just used, especially yeah. if they are uh, employed somewhere like a learning center or a tutorial center. Mm-hmm. Because um, I'm, I, I was a I was a lead teacher at the Sylvan uh, at, at a Huntington, owned a uh, private center for a while. And some of the things that uh, were very, very important for that process, that that fundamental process that you described was exactly that. Whenever a a student is struggling with the teaching and then uh, that that process of mastery and then the assessment, because those are 
you know, the assessment has to match instruction. Right. Mm-hmm. If right. assessment does not match instruction, something is wrong. So I guess my 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 question to you would uh, be to see if I interpreted this correctly, that um, the the idea is to change the way that the information is being presented yes. to the struggling student in either a, uh, uh, let's call it a, uh, a literacy that they have for video games, or by presenting it in a completely new way, which might be an area of interest for them, video games. Right. It's, 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 Is that the conceit? Um, yes, to an extent. Um, it's also presented with, um, especially for the younger kids, mm-hmm. um, more fun visuals and sound Mm -hmm. so we do have some people on staff that have worked for different um animation companies our our lead um our creative director essentially uh used to work for disney and uh, later don the don bluth company that doesn't surprise me at all um so that art style is reflected in a lot of what we do so there's a lot of this particularly appeals to the younger kids too to kind of get them engaged um and then also it's to not just present the information in a game-like way necessarily um, cause we do have all these standards that we have to meet. So we do have limitations, but educational also, standards, educational standards. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it's also, um, to, to make sure that what we're, what we're presenting is done in a way that is not, you know, exactly how they have seen it before. Cause they've already failed to get it in that way. Right. So we're trying to show them, you know, as much as we are able to do to deviate from that, um, show them a the same concept and teach them the same concept, but hopefully in a way that um, it is more hands-on and they're able to pick it up a little better. Okay, Chris, what's your answer to the question? I think this plays into what the the misconception about what a gamification is, why it is we're doing it. Because I think the the typical reason a lot of people come down to, it's not a bad reason, is that we have this content that is boring, or a lot of people perceive it as boring. And what's something that's fun that people like games? And so what can we, are we able to take this boring thing and put it into something that people find fun? And does that make then the learning fun? And, you know, in a lot of ways, I can, that was Sylvan's catchphrase actually when mm-hmm. I worked there, make Sylvan fun or make, 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 no, make learning fun. <laughs> that, that was your, uh, that, that was, was your, my, that was my own personal your charge there. there. Yeah. <laughs> make Sylvan fun. Um, no, but no, it was, it was make learning fun. That was actually yeah. their, their creed. It's, mm-hmm. it's such an interesting connection there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I can recall, for example, back when I was in school, um, you know, very occasionally they'd let you hop on the computers in the classroom and oh, do yeah. some sort of activity. And usually oh. it was kind of like Oregon Trail. Yeah, it was, it was something Where that in was, the world is Carmen San Diego. Something right? that was supplementing the learning you're already doing. Yep. Um, yeah. And so they are tests. And I think if for no other reason, we enjoyed that because it was a change of pace. You know, it wasn't sitting there at a desk being right. told something you were interacting with something you were engaging. It was cool because mm-hmm. you're on a computer and this is the 90s. And There's a some, mouse in my hand. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes you would get dysentery <laughs> and die yeah yeah um and so i mean some of my favorite learning experiences some of the ones that i remember the best even if vaguely are the ones where i was playing a game because it was this more engaging experience than just sitting there listening to a lecture yeah right but exactly. a common misconception is that it's the game that's making it fun when in fact the learning that happens in games is what makes games fun and right. so if you listen to the episode last week we talked a little bit about this but for those of you just now joining us raf coster's a theory of fun for game design i think is absolutely a required reading for anyone interested in game design in general, but especially games and learning. Yeah, because one of his thesis or his, his thesis in the book is essentially that the experience of fun, the fun that we have in games is actually learning um when we are presented with a challenge um it's kind of a survival instinct he talks about the physiological aspect of it um but when we are presented with a challenge um mastering that system coming to understand something better overcoming that challenge um basically triggers an endorphin response that makes us uh want to keep doing that and so it's sort of like the uh, people talk about like the dopamine uh cycle for example uh, right. in uh, game-based learning um kind of like these little dopamine rewards you get to keep you going as you're playing through something um but in games where that comes from is actually like i said mastering the system it's not just like you know the thing the, the thing that can kind of you know intrigue us at first is like oh when i push this button i jump and even that is learning something um and you kind of like if it, the game feels good it keeps you going which to keep doing mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. But then once you've figured out that pressing A makes me jump, then we're going to give you a thing you have to jump over. And when you learn how to jump over that, that's a little, ah, I just learned something. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they give you more and more difficult challenges. Like, okay, now you know how to jump. Can you uh, jump off of something and onto something else? 
and you kind of keep ramping it up that way. As soon as you stop having new things that you can learn is when the game becomes boring. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the argument that I like to make is that games are learning devices. And so that helps us as people are trying to teach things, because what we want to do is teach people. Yes. And so the learning itself is actually what's fun. All we have to do is figure out a way to apply what it is we're trying to teach to this game system. And, and I think what, that's what you just described there, I think. And, and we all understand it because of our backgrounds. But right. I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges when it comes to um, I know what my company it is, and I don't know how closely your company is in, engaged with. Mm -hmm actually meeting educational standards and getting teachers to understand the, the validity of what, you, what, you work, we, what you're working on. We do work um, um, not necessarily based on like a state curriculum or anything yeah. like that, but we do have very specific objectives that our stakeholders have where they want us to make sure that by the end of this, you know, these proficiencies are met or these understandings right. are achieved, that sort of thing. So, so the, the reason I kind of bring that up is because you were, the, the struggle that we have is that teachers see it as this is, this is not learning. This is, you know, recreation this mm -hmm. is playtime mm -hmm. um and there's that misconception there but there's also that misconception coming from um even the teachers some teachers um within i know within my company um they look at it and they go well you know because their background is education mm -hmm. and we have we, we employ a lot of teachers that help you know drive our curriculum and what we're teaching and um I, some of them have a background and some knowledge of, of games or, or game-like systems but many of them don't and they might you know they struggle to kind of see um, how, uh oh, well, we, we need to teach it this way because this is how I might have taught it in a classroom setting, or this is how I would teach it if I had pencil and paper, mm -hmm. but now we're trying to translate it to digital. And there's a little bit of a disconnect there um, that I think we're still trying to bridge that gap for people to understand, um, okay, well, this is what you did with a pencil and paper, but now we're trying to do it a different way. And we're still trying to teach the same concepts, but we have to teach them in a way that's going to be engaging. That's going to take advantage also of all the things that we can do mm -hmm. here in this digital space that we can't do in mm -hmm. an analog space necessarily. And maybe you can do it in an analog space if you had infinite resources mm -hmm. and you could purchase all these things. Um, board games are expensive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if your school is able to have, um, you know, buy a, a, just that one program and is able to disseminate it to all of their computers and, and is able to, you know, buy the licenses to do so. Um, then everyone can have that same experience without everybody having to buy um, all of these little pieces and all these little physical objects and mm -hmm. print all them out and then all the, all the money that might go into that too. So th there's, there's a little bit of, there's still a little bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is going to go away mm -hmm. as, as games become more and more ubiquitous ubiquitous mm -hmm. but right now there's still a little bit of, a, of an issue there and interestingly i think something that i came across a lot in my research back in the games and learning lab and i think we've come quite a quite a ways even from then because a lot of times what i was finding was just kind of like um you know surveys of let us tell you let's give you a summary of the findings of all these papers that are trying to talk about this you know it wasn't particularly useful a lot of times although because our, our approach is we we're trying to find very data-driven things to support the points um rather than just kind of talking about it in kind of an abstract sense um but you know one of the things i kind of came across a lot is people who wanted to think of games for learning as like basically um it is the curriculum. You sit a kid down in front of it and just let them go. The teacher doesn't have to even interact at all. Yes. Just let them go and let yes. that be the thing. And that, where, that is a problem. In yeah. fact, it's more of a hybrid approach where exactly. you're using the games to enhance the learning process overall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Jim, you may remember we encountered some of that with the project we were on, uh, which was a grant funded project. Mm -hmm. And one of the big stated goals was exactly that, that there needed to be a human component to the outcome. So that that's still a very big focus. Okay. So, um, you guys are talking a lot about, um, some of the challenges to, to getting it accepted and that sort of thing. I can see how that would change as the demographics change. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the average gamer uh, video gamer is in their late thirties. Um, it's actually plateaued right now just because so many younger gamers are, are playing games. Mm -hmm. Uh, like my, my son is three and yet he loves to play on the iPad. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely we love, we have to limit it to, to an hour a day and, and we're Jimmy, very careful. You, you even hinted earlier, you know, kids having trouble with PCs because yes. they've grown yeah. up with I, iPads I, and I iPhones. Want, so I wanted to talk, I did want to talk a little bit about that too, mm -hmm. actually, is that, that we're finding more and more. Um, I know in our company we are, and, and I think this is becoming more and more of a trend from what I've noticed as well. Um, because tablets are so intuitive, 
especially for little kids because they're so used to, you know, touching things, moving things, and sure. all that, um, that we're finding that I know our company, I don't know if yours does it, but we support, um, you know, PCs and uh, Macs, but we also support the, the iOS tablets, mm-hmm. Android tablets, and those have very different ways that you interact. Mm-hmm. And we're finding that um, kids are actually able to do a lot of the, a lot of the, especially newer activities that we're kind of almost designing with tablets in mind, um, which is very helpful for them. And they're able to, to really, and I'm talking about younger kids, obviously, but when it gets to, um, if, if they're on PCs, they struggle because they may not have, like they may have the manual dexterity to use their finger to trace, to trace a um, letter, for example, right. or trace a number, right. which is actual activities that we have, but they may not have that same dexterity if they have a mouse in their hand mm. and to do that same, that same trace. Right. It's motion. a different sort of hand-eye coordination. It's yeah. not the same. It requires a different sort of coordination. Well, as an educator, I personally recommend that a stylus be given to the students so they can practice their pencil grip mm-hmm. when, <laughs> instead of writing with their finger in that way. Uh, but the, the point holds. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I want you to go a little deeper with that if you can and talk a little bit more uh, about learning styles. Um, because I think this is a valid concern that, that I have heard and, and actually kind of share myself a little bit, which is whenever we do, uh, let's, let's just say a large amount of teaching using the, um, vocabulary of games, you know what I'm saying? The literacy of games, um, it, it introduces a potential problem, which is that whenever we have to go back into those more traditional spaces of sitting still at my desk, listening to the teacher, taking notes, taking a test, right? Um, writing an essay that, that if I learned it in a different way, then what I stated before about assessment matching instruction is no longer, there's a disconnect. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that might have to do with some learning styles. So maybe there are those who are, let's call them kinesthetic learners or uh, that kind of a thing, who are really engaged and overpowered and, and, and excited by the video game um, world mm-hmm. and what that means. But are we, are we running the risk of going too deep, too far in stuff we don't understand yet? What would your response be to that, to someone who said that? Uh, I mean, I would say, I would say, no, I think that we do. There, there is certainly better ways that we can we can improve the way that we're teaching. In my opinion, one of the biggest limitations that that, that we found, and it goes into that teacher thing, but it also goes into you're talking about demographics changing. Yeah. Um. Just to, I'm I'm going a little off track. I'm going to loop back around. Um. It's also an issue of um school boards and um, you know, politicians and people that are that are even older and have been in their position for a very long time and are very ingrained in their ways, and they're not really. You know, they don't understand how games can be used as a teaching tool. They don't understand that games can be inf- educational and informative. Um, and they see them as pure recreation. Mm-hmm. And it's even harder at that point as opposed to like a teacher that might be, you know, in, in his or her 30s and might, you know, might have grown up playing some games. And mm-hmm. might, even if they don't play games anymore, they understand, oh, you can learn things in games. Of course, I was playing Super Mario Bros. And I learned lots of stuff in games. Right. Not educational stuff that I can take on a test, but I learned something. So, of course, I could learn something educational if it's done right. Um, but then you have a lot of the, the people in these higher positions that are determining if their school is going to use whatever program it is, regardless of what the teacher wants. Those people tend to be much older and they have that even even more problem, you know, making that connection between games. Sure. Well, an administrator is probably going to be uh, older. Yes. Like like myself. Yes. Uh, but, uh, uh, but well, about half the yes. teachers are, are younger than me. I'm, I'm in my I'm in my 40s. Right. Uh, but about half the teachers are younger than me. And, and I would argue that since the average gamer is in their late 30s, that probably we're about over to that flashover point where someone, a teacher, for example, is going to say, I, I'm totally OK with the idea of, of one of my students using games. I think so, too. Yeah. And I think that that's going to change. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess my, my question is, have we have we rushed headlong into something we don't understand yet, or do we have the data for it? Um, there, there, are we, are we running the risk of, of damaging with this new technology I, by, I'll, I'll just be inflammatory and say by crippling students with this, um, single mode of learning. If it's not interactive, I'm going to be bored. I, I, I've got that dopamine rush. And no, if I, I don't have that, I'm never going to sit through algebra. Unfortunately, hmm. Doc, um, it's here whether we like it or not. Um, with with the advent of um, well, that settles it. No, I'm, <laughs> let me see where I'm going with that. The advent of smartphones and the way that they've um, oh, good basically taken over the lives of so many people, mm-hmm. and I mean that 
in actually kind of a literal way. It actually, just, they yeah. become their entire life. And I'm talking about social media, the way they interact with other people, um, the way that they, you know, their communities, these, they're all digital. They're all yeah. on the internet. And um, it's not like even when we were growing up when we had the internet at a certain point in our lives and then it became, you know, a big part for us through things like email and AOL chat. This is the internet in your pocket at every time and mm-hmm. every moment and every day. And I, I even remember the days when I was in school and I'm sure Chris can remember some of this maybe, and I'm not sure as much uh, on your end doc, cause it's kind of, kind of on that cusp there, all of us um, where you couldn't even have a cell phone in school. Mm-hmm. You couldn't even have, maybe, maybe they'd oh, yeah. let you have it. Maybe. And you better leave it in your bag and never take it out kind of thing. Now it's, of course you can have a cell phone in school. You, uh, you're not supposed to pull it out during when the teacher's talking perhaps, or during everybody the test, needs a but everybody has it. Everyone has it. Of course they don't need it. Mm. Obviously, yeah. We, we went through how many years of human history without it? Of course, we don't need it, but we all think we need it. Seven or eight, and yeah, seven or eight. Um, but my my point here is that that sort of you know stimulation is always there. Yeah. It's always going to be there, and there's all. And we have to you have to engage kids and understand that they do not they don't they're not going to have the same sort of um, patience and experience. Um, with some of those things like sitting there, listening to a lecture, taking notes, learning solely through that, and then taking a test and being okay with it. Um, I'm not saying, I don't, first of all, I don't think that's really the ideal part of learning anyway. I think that um, at least in my experience and the way that I've, um, I, I remember from school and things like that is that it's much more effective to have some sort of a hands-on approach. I know my, my sister is what she is a, um, a teacher. She's an elementary school teacher. And, um, you know, she talks to me about how she tries to engage with her kids and have them do, you know, group projects and, and things where they're working together or she's working with them. And it's not a she's standing up there and just saying, here's how you add, you know, three plus seven. And here's how you subtract seven minus eight, which would be negative, And they probably wouldn't do that at that age. But <laughs> but but yeah, but you get kind of my point, right? There's 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 always been this engagement and activity, I think, in classrooms. And I think some teachers are not necessarily making that connection. They're thinking, well, this is not really educational because I'm not the one that's saying so and so. Yeah, but think about it. Aren't you usually not like you might? Yeah, sure. Sometimes you'll give a lecture for a little while. Sometimes you'll just say something. But a lot of it is you're trying to do that lecture almost as like a, a, a preamble mm-hmm. to an activity to help engage them and help them think about it to either yeah. together or with you or, you know, an activity that they can do on their own. And this is an extension of that. I've actually got a couple of follow-up points uh, to a couple of the different things you said. So first regarding that, there's actually been some debate recently in like the learning community. And like, I'm, I'm more engaged strictly with like the professional development, talent development, learning community. But there've actually been some questions about like, do learning styles exist? Oh yeah. That's another, that's another topic. Too. <laughs> I, true, I true, talk about that a lot. But, yeah. And I think to clarify oh, yeah. a little bit what we mean by that, it's not so much like, Oh, this person's a visual learner. Therefore yeah. we need to just tailor it to them. This person's an auditory learner. So we need to tailor it to them. It's actually that everyone has a little bit of everything. Exactly. And what we need to be doing is mixing up our approach with everyone so that we can be reinforcing in different ways yes. to gain better mastery. Call Howard Gardner. It's, let him know. It's, uh, if I could just do one segue real quick, but it's like, it's the, um, it's the mental aspect of muscle confusion. <laughs> if you've heard of that from lift, working, working out, the idea is that you don't want to do the exact same exercise all the time. You want to use, do different exercises that trigger the same muscle. Mm. So the same idea would be, would hold true with, with this too. You know, you don't want to teach someone the same way every time mm-hmm. you're going to get bored. Yeah. So you teach them some visual, mm-hmm. some auditory and some kinesthetic. Mm-hmm. And um, the other point, too, you know, going back to what you were saying, Jim, you know, like phones are already here and all this, like the, the dopamine worry. Um, actually, we were just watching a thing the other day, um, a, a talk that was touching on the idea of the uh, dopamine opioid cycle, um, where what we have right now in a lot of app design is kind of this endless thing where you go on Twitter, for example, and you see like all this news or all these interesting little tidbits. Mm-hmm. And it basically it's just a dopamine cycle yeah. where it's just dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. And it will keep you going for a long time until you kind of realize what's happening. And then you're kind of unsatisfied. What happens uh, after the dopamine phase ideally is what they call the opioid phase, where you've gotten something and now you're able to just kind of enjoy it. I think one of the examples they had, for example, is you go through a long day at work, you want to go and get a beer and socialize. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you've had that beer and you are socializing, you go into the opioid phase where you're able to just kind of enjoy it and relax and you know kind of be in that state. And then there's the next thing you want, which is the dopamine response when you finally get it. The alternative to that would be, for example, you just want a beer and you want another beer and you want another beer, but you're not actually getting to just relax and enjoy it. 
Um, and then that can only last so long before you just kind of crash and it's not appealing anymore. Yeah. Uh, I believe that they call that alcoholism. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Um, but you know, the same thing can apply to smartphones where like when we just have this dopamine response, um, sometimes that can carry us for a very, very long time. Um, but sometimes it helps to have kind of like the end state of I've achieved what it was I wanted from this and now let's just enjoy it and move on to something else. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that opioid state actually comes in with this game stuff where like, yes, we have like this little rush of like, Hey, this is fun. This is awesome. I've learned something. Now let's shift gears and do something else or even just change topics entirely um, so that you can kind of recover from that and not just be constantly wired, if that makes sense. Like muscle confusion. Great, great <laughs> examples to, to and, and answers to that question, actually. Thanks for letting me play devil's advocate on that one. That was, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, so what I'm hearing you guys say is it just like with anything, you can get too much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. And of so course, you've yeah, got to, you've got to make sure that, that you are pacing this. And I mean, if you, if you hand a kid an iPad and you're like, here, learn algebra, that mm -hmm. might not be the best mm -hmm. solution. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it does take a teacher that like, you know, situations that a game, we can program a lot into a game to like react to people if they're having trouble with something, mm -hmm. but sometimes it really does take a human touch, you know, to the points we've made earlier right. for a teacher to observe they're having trouble with this concept. Let me explain it in a way that me knowing this student, I can say, Here's how you need to do this. And, sure. and one thing we actually do at iStation to kind of directly on that point, um, we have something called a teacher teacher directed lesson or a TDL, uh, which is essentially um, once the kid performs badly in a particular lesson or essentially fails a particular activity or a set of activities, whatever that standard may be, um, they they're put on a report, a priority report. And that teacher is notified and they're so that they know, okay, this kid is really having trouble. Um, in this particular concept or mastering this concept. And we also, um, and I say we, I'm not involved at all in the TDL process. It's really um, the curriculum uh, people, the curriculum writers, which are educators, as well as uh, the art department who does some of the art for it. But they have these things called teacher-directed lessons. And the concept here is that you're providing a lesson, kind of a lesson plan, so to speak, for one particular concept or a set of concepts to a teacher that they're supposed to present specifically, they're specifically designed for the kid that cannot get this concept in the digital form. So they were already considered a kid that was having trouble, um, which means they didn't learn it in school in the way that you may have taught it or they may have been taught it before. Then we have the you know digital part, the actual game, the learning game, um, but they failed that too. They didn't get it there too. So then on the back end, there's the teacher-directed lesson, which is not digital at all. It's completely analog. It's completely a, the teacher goes to the kid and they're given this particular like concept and um, the tools to help them teach that concept in an analog way. So it's like, it, that kind of gives the kids, at the very least, um, assuming it's a good teacher that follows this, this format, um, three different ways to teach the kid. There's the initial, whatever way the teacher tried to teach him before in classroom. There's the, you know, digital way with the, with the program itself, the iStation application itself. And then there's the, okay, they've still not got it. I mean, and that's even going through all the reteach stuff in that tool. And then if they still haven't got it, the teacher directed lesson as an analog um, format outside of the program, but is still being provided as a additional resource with the program. That's wonderful. That's, I think, a, a very healthy and balanced way to look at that as, as a tool. Mm -hmm. I actually like to come back to that idea of, of it being a tool, but um, I think one of the strengths of any kind of a guided uh, learning process was you remember again, and you've got instruction, uh, basically guided practice, then independent practice and then assessment. That's the, the standard mm -hmm. uh, teaching learning model. Yeah. So um, directly called that, too yeah. internally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I learned that. I, I learned that at, you know when I was in college and, yeah. and an educator before we even envisioned that there were such things as, as video games that would teach. Um, but what what I I am personally compelled by is the idea of uh, learners who are in different places mm -hmm. in in their learning, and it can track them individually. And so I can be uh, in a classroom as a teacher giving time to interact with this idea and maybe little Jimmy over there is uh, somewhere very, very different than little Chris is yes, on the other exactly. end. Uh, and so it's one of those deals where um, I think that a lot of the potential has to do with the individualization. Now that said, are our tools there or are we still creating these uh, I think you used the word generic mm -hmm. earlier, Chris. Um, are we creating these generic tools that are being used 
um, by everyone, and then they just kind of find their place in the generic thing? Or is it truly adaptive? Um, to, to give it a little bit of context, uh, back in my Sylvan days, I also worked on the other side of the wall, and I actually worked at the Sylvan Testing Center, mm. which later became the Prometric Testing Center. If you've ever taken the GRE, the GMAT, the nursing test, the doctor test, or gotten your Texas real estate certificate, or half a dozen other tests, you probably went into a computer administrative testing center, right? You know, the kind of place I'm talking about. So I I worked the desk and I was the guy who was like, please sign in and you can't go to the bathroom and you have your cup of coffee. And (laughs) that was me. Um, But what I had to do was take a test about all these different tests and how they were administrated, which was really interesting. And I I couldn't even take the, the, the GRE for like a year after not working that job, which was again, really secure, that kind of a thing, because some of those tests are, um, highly, highly secure, and we're talking million dollar um, industry here, uh, well, billion dollar industry, but million dollar tests specifically, because they are uh, very proprietary, and this was 10 years ago, but very proprietary technology, specifically the computer adapted test. Yeah. And ours is specifically, it is a computer adaptive test. That's actually one of the things that we sell it on. Excellent. It is a specifically adaptive. Like it's a little bit what I alluded to before, but it's the concept of um, before they even get into the program, they ha- and they actually retake the test every. Um, depends on it depends on the district and how old they are. Um, for young the younger kids, they take it more often, like once a month. Old the oldest kids, like in middle school, they only take it. I think once every like four to six months. I forget exactly, mm-hmm. but they take an uh, what we call an, an assessment, or actually it's the um, we call it the ISIP, which I think it's I Station Standards of something practice. I don't even remember. I feel terrible for not remembering, but we always use the acronym, but it's basically a test to see um, what they know and what they don't know. And that determines what lessons they, they see. And then also as they're progressing through the program and see those lessons, depending on their performance, they moved somewhere else in the program mm-hmm. or as we call it routing. So they go somewhere else. And so the big selling point of, of the company of, of the application itself of iStation is that it is adaptive. It adapts to um, the, the learning needs of the student and what they already know. That's phenomenal. Or don't know. So yes, and it is considered a, a, a we use that term actually in-house a lot, CAT. We use nice. that term a lot. Nice. Do you ever use the term uh, curriculum compacting? That, no, I have not. Heard that's that. one that I learned whenever I was doing my, um, my, my master's work is actually in gifted and talented studies. Mm-hmm. And so one of the challenges there is you've got a student who uh, during the lesson has read ahead um, or, or is incredibly intuitive, totally gets it, and has already done the assignment, yeah. um, and, and is now ready to pull out his phone and play a game. Genuinely, he if he were tested right now, or, or even a week from now, he'd have it. What do you do with a kid like that whenever you've got, you know, somebody else who's across the room, Johnny's across the room, and he's struggling, and he totally missed everything the teacher just said. And what he really needs is something that's going to be interactive so that he can learn it. And you've got these these kids who are on completely in uh, different ends of, of their, you know, their learning, but they're in the same classroom together. I think that's the flaw right there, in my opinion. But That they're in the classroom together? Yeah, so what we need is the eagles and the ducks uh, in different classrooms, like they did in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if I think if you're a gifted child or if you're a you shouldn't be in the same classroom as in my opinion, that's my opinion. I think it depends on the curriculum largely and, mm-hmm. and the way that's it's, it's structured. But that's a that's a personal opinion. I guess what I'm really asking here per, per the topic mm-hmm. is, does the technology do, do games have the potential to fill this gap um, and allow interest based learning and what we might call contracting or uh, some other form of uh you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting over here and I've got this. I've now earned the right for that pull out. You, what we were just talking about that pull out chance to go over to the computer and, uh, you know, play Oregon trail, except I'm not doing it over at the computer and playing Oregon trail. I finished my work. I pull out my cell phone and somehow governed by the school and monitored by the teacher. I'm able to engage in an independent study project that I've been been going yeah. on. You know I, what I'm saying? I, I don't think we're there yet, in my opinion. Well, and I, I but think, I think that we, but I think that we can be, and that's kind of what I was saying. I think that's that's the problem that I think we have is that it's difficult to get to that point and to to have these, you know, the older administrators understand that this is not recreation; it is still learning. Mm. Um, but I think the other part of it is too. Um, there is a little bit from the teachers as well that may still 
there's still this idea of, okay, and I, a part of it is honestly not even the teachers. It's coming from the way that we do standards. I know in our company, we're very strict about following all the different standards and all, and all this kind of things. Well, you and, have to be. And, but it's not just about following the standards. It's about we have to go, we have to, um, in order to get a contract, in order to have any, like, you know, school district pick us up, they have to go through, uh, we have to go through this approval process and we have to prove did we actually hit the standard and to the people and like, and they have to go through and they yep. say, did they used to do that? And so because the people looking at that may not understand what we're trying to do, they or, or, or what, how this digital environment works, we could very easily miss and have missed things because we weren't, it wasn't clear enough to them, even though it may have actually hit the right. standards for real. So there's a, there's a, there is a disconnect there. And I think it's a big problem because you want to teach kids in a way that is different and you want to show like, here's a, here's another way that they can learn. And I think that games um, and have so much potential there, like you're saying to do that, to bridge that gap. But at least I know at least my company does not have that freedom to do so. In my opinion, doesn't have the freedom yeah. because we have to hit all these different standards. Now, Chris may have a different experience because mm. it, it sounds like you don't necessarily have, because we have very stringent mm. standards at my company. Yeah, um, there, there are key objectives we want to hit. And one of the things we always go through is um, talking with our subject matter experts, yeah. our SMEs, right, right. Um, talking to our stakeholders to make sure that we are uh, demonstrably like we have to at least be able to argue that we are hitting the objectives that we are setting out to hit. You got to evidence it somehow. Yeah. And and that's part of the challenge actually in our industry is how do you achieve that evidence? And I like to think that our company is pretty good at having systems like here are the measurables we're going to look at to Mm -hmm. see if we're actually being effective. Um, But a lot of times you just kind of have the thing uh, for, for a lot of companies, this sort of training is kind of just checking off a list. They have to do it for compliance reasons. They have to do it because whatever, but there are a lot of times too, when they're learning, isn't actually all that effective. It's more just the learning they do in the field that's effective and that's why i think you know the challenge that we have right now is a lot of people want to sort of take the same old um, e-learnings are kind of the very standard thing right now where if it's not instructor led training where someone's up at the front of the classroom teaching a class um it's basically just a you sit down in front of a computer and it's basically a glorified PowerPoint where it just yeah. goes through. Maybe there's a voice reading to you. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a little knowledge check in between at checkpoints or at the end that says, uh, you know, answer these questions correctly. If you get them wrong, you have to go back and you know do a little if something. If you've ever taken if you ever gotten a, an accident, and you're trying to get it off your I'm not an accident. If you ever gotten a speeding ticket mm-hmm. or a parking ticket and you're trying to get it off your record. Um, you can take one of these defensive driving. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You can do it completely over. A and so, yeah. And part of our company's mission is to take that sort of thing and make it more engaging, to make it more fun, to make it more interesting, more effective. Um, and I like to think that we're pretty good at it. Um, but, you know, and I, I mentioned before, you know, there's kind of the gamification, the pointsification where people catch on to the buzzword of like they want to incorporate game like elements into their stuff. And sometimes just adding a game like element can make it a, that much more interesting. But I think where people kind of miss the mark. And I think the, the single thing I think that most people are missing when they're turning something into a game or trying to make it more game, like is the risk of failure. Um, a lot of times people want to kind of like hold the learner's hand through things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, no, that, that's a, that's and a very big, very, problem, I agree. very central to a game is giving the player a chance or the learner in this case, a chance to fail. Right. Um, even if it's as simple as you have to retry this little section again. Um, but when they learn that they have to actually like figure out how to beat this thing, which means learning what it is we need them to learn to get past it. That's when, you know, games can really shine. Yeah. Yeah. They're learning by doing, they're learning by failing sometimes, but, you know, going through the system and mastering the system. And, you know, that's one of the tricky things about gamification is taking content that's not necessarily lending itself to a game, at least not super intuitively and adapting Mm -hmm. it into, okay, even if we have to sort of tell them some information, which is like, you know, a trap that's really hard to get out of, at least in the interaction, can we teach them a concept directly or indirectly that kind of will help them with this apply it somehow i, I think that that hand holding is is a huge i know it's a huge problem for me at i station to help some people understand um but that idea of well what if they don't know what to do yeah that's kind of the point <laughs> they'll figure it out and yeah. if they don't but what if they don't figure it out then they fail and they'll do it again mm-hmm. yeah. that's the point that's what makes it fun mm-hmm. and it's really hard to get that get that across because mm-hmm. they're so afraid of yep. losing them yep. by not telling them exactly what they have to do. No, don't tell them exactly what they have to do. Mm-hmm. If you do that, it's it's not fun anymore. Yeah, mm-hmm. You know, when I tell people about my weekly game night, board game night, um, what, what I hear most common is, oh, I'm not smart enough for those kind of games. 
Yeah. And the irony yeah. of that is, neither was I before yeah. I started playing. Them. You, you get smart no at those games was. by playing those games. Yeah, and, you, and you it's learn. An excuse. Yeah, you, you you make mistakes. You, yeah. uh, I mean, a lot of times when you're even learning the game, you learn by playing the game. You can't just read the rules and hold it on in your yeah. head. You have to like yeah. you know sort of just start around and be told like, okay, so what do I do with this piece? You know, and yeah, then exactly. someone tells you. Exactly. I can't even do. I, I a lot of times I don't even want to know the rules. I mean, people start. <laughs> How do you play this game? And then someone will start reading off the rules. Like, can we just play the game? Yeah, yeah. Learn, just learn by doing just, it. Just I'll play fail, the yeah. game. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's interesting is everything you guys just said about um, standards and and trying to meet you know these very rigorous expectations. Everything about stockholders. Everything mm-hmm. about or stakeholders. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know all of that. It reminds me so so much of the process of. Uh, accreditation mm-hmm. of, of private school accreditation. Uh, back whenever we owned our private school, mm-hmm. we went through some of that process, uh, and we ended up selling the school before that ended. And th- the new owners took over, and it is now accredited, which is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. But that was it. Took, it was a year, many years long process. Because of exactly what you're talking about, choosing a standard, demonstrating, you have probationary status, you have the you know the the in between time. And finally, when you do get that accreditation, it is a huge deal Mm -hmm. because it means that you are certified. It's like, it's like teacher certification for a school, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, So what, what an interesting connection that I'm, I'm making here as you guys are talking all of this out is that making a game and it really doesn't even matter what system it's for is a bit like starting from scratch and creating an entire school that's going to fit on your phone. Yeah. That's in a, in a huge. Way. That's huge because you've got teachers making curriculum. You've got systems that go into place. You've got rules and and sort of almost even on an administrative level. Mm-hmm. How what's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? Um, how's it going to connect to the other software that we make? All of this stuff. And uh, to me, then that that really shows uh, that we're on the right track. I think. I, I think because. Uh, to, to me, that that leads to the obvious question, and I think this will be our, our, our last question and way of closing this up here. Two part question: mm. um, What have we done right slash wrong, and where do you see this going? What is the future of learning based video games? Um, I think I think where we've gone right is um, we are. I talked a lot about the limitations of adhering to standards and, and, and all that, but I do think that's important too, yeah. to make sure that we, um, it is educationally valid and we're using the best metrics that we know of to do so at the moment. So I feel that, 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 that level of concern needs to continue. It's just that the, the, where we can improve part and these, these, those two questions are really more like one of the same. They all, they interact with one another mm-hmm. and where we can improve is that understanding of, um, especially in my company, but other other others have the same problem that I'm talking about is that issue of handholding. And we're going to be able to, I, I do feel it's going to come probably sooner than we think too. Um, being able to, to have some faith. There's, there's that, there that is again, that word again, trust have the some, player. some trust and some faith in the player. And, and in this case, the student who is our player, the student player mm-hmm. um, to not just figure out what we want them to figure out in terms of how the interface works to, to prove mastery and to show that they, they have mastered this concept, but also um, trust that they want to yeah. have faith that they yeah. want to learn. And also in some cases it comes down to being a little bit self-directed, like yes. taking challenges on in any order they want, um, yes. approaching different subjects in the order they want, that sort of thing. Oh, nonlinearity is yeah. huge. Yeah. Oh, I could talk a lot more about that and some of the things that we're trying to do in that field as mm-hmm. well. And yeah. all the challenges that come with that gap learning, yeah. man, that is big. Yeah. But, but Chris, what are, what are your responses to this? So, yeah, I think one of the things we've really done right, and again, this is kind of going back to my experience in school, is that a lot of games, at least at the very least, the ones that are kind of like, OK, we're going to now play Oregon Trail. We're going to play Math Blaster as like an alternative activity or something like that. Um, it's applied practice uh, in a really fun way. And so it even makes, for example, drilling, which is sometimes something people don't like to do. But like if you just need to memorize your edition or something like that, mm-hmm. right, it, the games can make the drilling a whole lot more fun than flashcards or whatever other thing you're doing. A lot of times oh, yeah. people try to sort of like even, you know, without thinking about it, they sort of make a game out of, say, flashcards where you're trying to like 
like see how many you can get before you miss one or something like that. You know, we do this very naturally. And this is actually, you know, not to sidetrack us too much, going back to um, you know, defining a game. One is Chris Crawford's definition of a game uses dichotomies. And um, I, I'm not going to recite it all right now. And some people take issue with the definition. But for example, uh, what's the difference between a a game and a play thing? A game has rules. A play thing is something that is just an object that you can add rules to externally to turn it into a game. And in a digital space, mm-hmm. that would be a digital play space or mm-hmm. a digital play thing, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is not the same as a game. Yeah. I, I like yeah. that term, though, yeah. because I think there's some definite, definitely some things that we say, this is a game. Uh, it's actually a play thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like it. I think where I see it going is using integrating it more so it's less of like an alternative activity that just kind of reinforces what you're teaching it's the sort of stuff i station's doing where it's more core to the curriculum even though it's not necessarily the only thing they're going through right um but i also think that what we need to get to is uh i think the hand holding the lack of risk all that different stuff is something that really needs to change because very core to gaming is the Mm -hmm. risk of failure and um this has been a big push even in uh in professional learning design um not even just with a particular course, but just with like, you know, say job support, um, performance support in general, um, letting them look for what they need at the moment of apply is something that we talk about mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. rather than putting them all the way through a curriculum and hoping they remember it all, giving them the resources so that when they're on the job and they need to know something, they can have access to it. And I think that both within and without the games, um, sort of having the self-directed, let them take responsibility. It's, it's, it's a risk, but you're going to find the people who are motivated to do their jobs well or to learn um, right. are going to do this on their own anyway. Mm-hmm. And so encouraging that uh, through the way we design both curricula and the way that we design games, the way we design lessons, I think is something that we're going to keep improving on. And uh, I'm really excited actually to see um, how the principles of game design start getting folded into even things that don't even look like games. Um, I think that's something that we're going to see in the future. That makes a lot of sense to me. My answer to the question is um, to do with flow theory. Actually, I, mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of flow theory. I, I think that that psychological principle applied towards games mm-hmm. uh, has been done very, very successfully. There's lots of uh, scholars who've written on that. No need to necessarily cite them. Uh, but what I, I'm optimistic about the future types of learning games what they'll be able to do is through some kind of play-based pre-assessment that doesn't even feel like assessment, Mm -hmm. level you very, very quickly to the place where you can uh, comfortably challenge yourself Mm -hmm. to learn. Without being too frustrated. With Yes, without Mm -hmm. being frustrated, because that's what flow theory Mm -hmm. is. Or becoming bored because it's too easy. Bingo. That is exactly what what it is. And so it's your ability. It's it's almost like like a math problem itself. It's Mm -hmm. ability over Mm -hmm. frustration. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where where we need our games to take people quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think the danger right now, and I don't know if it's a design problem or if it's just, we're not quite there yet, but the danger I think of, of games right now is we hand the pad to the kid and the kid plays the same thing over and over and over of something he's already mastered. Mm -hmm. And he's engaging in that, what we talked about before the dopamine cycle Mm -hmm. without actually learning anything meaningful. Right. And I think that that is a design flaw that could be quickly overcome Mm -hmm. Through something very simple like flow theory. Yeah. Um, so anyway, and, and it's been done. Um, you know, there there are those who are uh, like uh, Genova Chen uh, has has done some work in that. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um, anyway, this was a fun discussion, guys. Yeah, for Education sure. Education yeah, and I games. Agree. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of feedback we get uh, in our email inbox at backward compatible dot com. That one. Yeah. Uh, and if you have like you know some feedback, some thoughts, any questions, um, you know, feel free to write us, and we'll definitely respond to it on the show. Um, also, if you find the show uh, useful or interesting, please uh, feel free to share it with your friends. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter, uh, SoundCloud, uh, even YouTube. Although we're working on updating the YouTube, we're on uh, Stitcher too. Yes. <laughs> We are. I, I kind of ignore Stitcher, but yes, we are uh, we are technically on Stitcher. Everyone ignores <laughs> Stitcher; it's fine. <laughs> also, you can engage with us on our Facebook page, um, on our Twitter channel. Um, it's um, Twitter is uh, at backward uh, com- at backward compat, mm-hmm. um, and our Facebook page, I believe, is just called backward compatible. Is that correct? I think it's actually facebook.com slash backward compat. Okay. Although, if you look for backward You're right. compatible, we did we did mm-hmm. we did shorten it to back compat on purpose mm-hmm. across so, a couple to, areas to match them. Yeah. Yes, um, and then of course. Um, so we have those two. Also, you can go to our website, um, backward-compatible.com, um, and you can, um, we have uh, comments on a, each of our posts. You can go ahead and comment there. We will get a message when you do. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a lot of different ways to contact us, interact, um, talk, and we will 
you know, if you do send us a, a direct message on, you know, to, on our Facebook or on our, on our Twitter account, we'll try to respond to it and mm-hmm. we can have a conversation about some of this and pick it up at a later time. Because dialogue makes everyone better. Yeah, that. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you again for joining us, everyone, for episode number 108 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on games and learning, gamification. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.